Well, good evening. Welcome to Pastor's Ministry Workshop, our first PMW for the year 2012. How about that? We are uh, resuming systematic theology. This is uh, a uh, study that we have done in segments, in chunks, as it were. We've worked our way through all the volumes leading to where we are now in Volume 6, not Volume 7, as I mistakenly said earlier. Volume 6, the volume on pneumatology. So I'm going to use tonight as an introductory session and uh, chart out where the reading assignments are going to be, and uh, we'll discuss those, and then we'll give some introductory thoughts to uh, pneumatology as Schaefer does so in his text. We'll actually read through his uh, prologue together, his preface together, and then uh, we will look at some scriptures. I'll share some thoughts and then uh, take any questions you might have and kind of just give a preview for what we're going to do over the course of 10 weeks, uh, including the introductory session. Introdu introductory section and nine reading weeks rather than ten reading weeks. I, I got to looking over it this afternoon and I think given that we're going to be stretched out, uh, I think we'll do better with nine sessions rather than ten sessions. So I'll spell all that out for you as well. Before we begin, let's take a moment for silent prayer to commit our heart to the Lord and to humble ourselves under the authority of His truth. Shall we pray? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the privilege we have to assemble together to receive instruction. Father, to study to show ourselves approved, and we rejoice in so many of our classes. We're studying your word. In these ministry workshop classes, we tend to study about your word. And uh, I thank you here this hour that we can actually do both. As we study about your word, that study itself comes from your word. So Father, uh, I pray that you would equip us I uh, thank you that we have the privilege to be able to teach systematic theology in a local church context, that we're not uh, setting apart certain realms of theology and saying that only certain believers, uh, special believers, <laughs> are uh, entitled to such special knowledge. Father, uh, the secret things belong to you, but the things revealed belong to us, all of us, and our children forever, Father. So I pray that we would be humble under the authority of your word tonight that uh, the, the Holy Spirit, the very same Holy Spirit we're studying, the Holy Spirit would open the eyes of our understanding, and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. All right, don't let the fancy term scare you. Pneumatology. Starts with a P, pneumatology, if you want. Pronounce it that way, but people would laugh at you if you pronounce it pneumatology. So just pronounce it pneumatology with a silent P. And uh, it's the study of the Holy Spirit. Pneuma, meaning spirit, breath, or wind. Uh, from the Greek, ruch, in the uh, Hebrew, but uh, pneumatology is much easier to pronounce than ruchatology, or whatever we would do with it there. So we have what we have. Let me get the projector running so you'll see what I'm looking at. First of all, uh, does everybody have a text available of Lewis Berry Schaefer, of his systematic theology? Do you have one that you own? Do you have one that you borrow? Do you need one? Uh, should we, can we provide uh, PDFs at, at whatever point? Do you have a Schaefer? Is anyone Schaefer-less? You're Schaefer-less. We'll get you one. All right. We have two sets in our library. I have two more sets at my house. And uh, I have uh, the electronic version of my Bible software. And I use my electronic version so much now that I very rarely open up the print version anymore, only to check to see if there is, in fact, a typo. Oh, that's scary only to see if there's in fact a typo or something that I want to uh, check in the, uh, the print edition. But volume six is our volume on pneumatology. Now, if this is your first time to attend a systematic theology course, relax because uh, we're going to start over at the beginning again the next time around. And so uh, it's the nature of our training ministry that we're going to constantly, from now to the rapture, we're going to keep a systematic theology course always running at all times. And uh, so that means that when we wrap up like we're doing here, we're going to return back to the beginning again with prolegomena, with bibliology, on, uh, on the intermediate and advanced levels that systematic theology takes it. Don't confuse that with uh, the bibliology you're going to get in basic doctrinal studies. They, they go well together, uh, but you want to understand that one is foundational and leads to the other. So, uh, also, for those of you that have slugged your way through Schaefer this whole time, um, I am considering that the next time we do systematic theology, it will be Geisler rather than Schaefer, but I haven't made up my mind on that because for 20 years now, I've been saturated with Schaefer, and while I love Geisler, 
uh, it would be a new experience for me to teach it. So uh, pray over that. We'll see if maybe one more time through Schaefer and then the next time through Geisler, or maybe the time coming up is the time we'll make the switch to Geisler. Uh, we'll just leave that in the Lord's hands. Volume 6 is our study on pneumatology and uh, the preface for this, which every student should read, which every student should read. I think very few actually do. <laughs> I think uh, most folks just, you know, open up a book, they see prologue, preface, introduction, whatever, just flip off through that, get to, get to the beginning, get to chapter one. Let's, let's start digging into this. And uh, maybe if with some textbooks, you can get away with that um, and then go back maybe and read the preface later on. Um, I, I've learned, though, that with Schaefer, you want to read uh, straight through and you want to read the preface because he tells you in the preface where he's going to take you in the text. And if you can grasp the preface, then that'll do you some favors down the road with the text. Pneumatology is the scientific treatment of any or all facts related to spirit. As I said, the term pneuma means spirit, wind, or breath. It is totally the equivalent of the Hebrew ruch, which also means spirit, wind, or breath. And as such, it has a variety of applications. It refers to God himself, because God is spirit. So, first of all, it has its bearing look at that, uh, on theology proper, the general doctrine related to the divine spirit, that is, God is spirit. And then, obviously, the member of Trinity who is characterized as spirit, the spirit of holiness, or God's holy spirit, the third member of Trinity, as we understand it. But also, technically speaking, a study on pneumatology would include all the angels. Angels as well are pneumata. They are spirit beings. And so as such, if, a, if we're going to be technical about it, uh, a comprehensive pneumatology would have to include angels as well. Uh, Schaefer does tell you, though, that his won't do that because he already covered angels previously in uh, volume two, I think it was, angelology. And so that's already been covered. And then thirdly, there is a study on the immaterial part of man. The fact that we have soul and spirit within each one of us as believers. We have a soul and we have a living human spirit that is called a pneuma. All right. And the term human spirit, by the way, is our theological term that we apply to it. The Bible simply calls it pneuma. That each one of us has pneuma within us as believers. And so it's in the context as we study that we learn the difference between we see the word pneuma and we ask ourselves. All right. What spirit is this? Is this God the Holy Spirit? Is this our human spirit within us? Is this an angelic being of some sort, either elect or fallen? Both are called pneuma. All right. Or is it a more general sense of spirit, the spirit of the age, the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience? Is it a philosophical thought system promoted by those evil spirits that run this world? So this is a study where vocabulary doesn't bail us out. <laughs> then we look at the vocabulary and we say, okay, now, what's the context? What's the application related to this? And we uh, apply discernment to rightly divide the word of truth. So the specific study of the immaterial part of man, which division of the subject is now termed psychology, and to call it by the term suke for soul, relates it there appropriately. Now, he, he goes on to say that angels have already been developed under angelology. Uh, of course, we've dealt with trinity under theology proper. Uh, and that's what we have here, is that we have really an expansion upon anything that was said in theology proper related to the Holy Spirit is now going to be expanded in its own volume, okay? And he did this in two of the three members of Trinity. He gave theology proper, showing the, the proof of Trinity, showing Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and so forth. He then had a whole volume, volume five, that expanded on Christology, magnifying the second member of, of, of Trinity. And now uh, volume six, uh, that expands on pneumatology, giving a full comprehensive development on God and the Holy Spirit. Never once does he give a volume dedicated to God the Father. There's no paterology volume in Schaefer's text. And it was always Ralph Braun's lifelong dream to write that text. And uh, at least as of January 2012, uh, no such publication has come into existence. But he keeps thinking about it, talking about it. I keep praying about it, that, uh, that he would do so. And God would actually work through Ralph and other men and whoever to uh, put a volume of paterology out there as I think it is uh, would be absolutely necessary. So he goes on to describe here how volume 5 Christology and now volume 6 Pneumatology. Whatever is true of the triune God is true of the Holy Spirit. So everything that relates to God himself is equally true to the Holy Spirit if it's related to all of Trinity. Okay, Not the particular things 
to the Father, the particular things to the Son. But anything that's true of the triune God as, as a whole is going to be true of the Holy Spirit. That means He's sovereign, He's righteous, He's just, He's loving, He's eternal, He's omnipotent. All of the attributes that we apply to the Godhead, to the Trinity, is equally applied to God the Holy Spirit. Um, he says, a strange neglect of the Holy Spirit's full identity is and ever has been abroad, which neglect is deplored by all attentive expositors. And that is true as it relates to the fact outside of Pentecostal circles, uh, the Holy Spirit is not stressed as often. All right, And I think it's largely because of a reluctance to overdo it a reluctance to make the errors that some folks make as it pertains to the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, for want of extended and constructive teaching with respect to the Holy Spirit, the Christian church is, for the most part, in the same position as the 12 disciples of John the Baptist, whom Paul found at Ephesus. And this is the thing in Acts 19 too, where uh, he says to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay. There is a group of believers with a uh, deficient pneumatology. Would you agree? All right. And his statement in his introduction is that uh, many Christians today are just as pneumatologically deficient. That they really, I mean, they might grasp a concept. They may say, okay, Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But then when you really press them and ask them for details, say, well, tell me more about the Holy Spirit specifically. What does he do? What's his role? How, um, how does he impact your life on a daily basis? All right? And that's when a lot of believers will just start to hem and haw and guess, and well, you know, I'm not, not really sure. All right? And that's the problem. Uh, we have believers that are only operating with two-thirds of Trinity and probably less than that. All right? Because functionally, really immature Christianity, all they have is the Jesus who saved them, and they don't have the maturity of, of their father, and they clearly don't have an effective pneumatology to empower what they're doing. Doubtless some natural causes lie behind the fact that Christians generally are so little informed regarding this great theme. One, there is no lack of plain revelation regarding the Holy Spirit. It's amazing. The Bible has a lot to say about the Holy Spirit. But then again, what do we have for the most part? The Bible takes work. It takes effort. Believers have to study to show themselves approved. They have to be diligent, rightly dividing the word of truth. They have to, it's, it takes effort, it takes work. Be careful how you walk as wise men, you understand. And because it takes work, particularly in the end times in which we live, uh, people don't want that. They want to have their ears tickled. They just want to be, uh, they want to be, uh, they want to feel good. They want to be happy. They want to be, they'd be told they're okay. They don't want to think. Come on, that takes too much work, <laughs> as it were. Some other things that he goes into here. And I suspect many of the same deficiencies that he experienced in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s are only worse today, some 70 years later now. So we, uh, I think, can testify to that as well. I meant to highlight something here. He talks about why it is that people will kind of steer clear of certain things. Almost every error or disproportionate emphasis upon some aspect of doctrine on the part of a few, here it is. I should just color this so I can find it next time. This is very worthwhile. If this was a uh, Kindle, I would post this on Facebook. All right. Almost every error or disproportionate emphasis I mean, even if something's not taught in error, if it's disproportionately emphasized above and beyond the emphasis Scripture puts on it, well, then we're taking a doctrine out of proportion. We're taking a doctrine out of its original sense and we're overstressing it or understressing it. Almost every error or disproportionate emphasis upon some aspect of doctrine on the part of a few is caused by the neglect of that truth on the part of the many. Okay, and it's not just a pneumatology. I think I agree with Schaefer on this. I think it applies in a lot of realms. And, uh, and some churches go so overboard with a hyper phony emotionalism. And so then other churches step back and say, oh, whoa, we don't want to go there. And so what happens? They go overboard the other direction and become a, a, a Vulcan-like, emotion-free, intellectual 
uh, Christian walk. And that's not biblical. All right. 